Uh, hey everyone, Th this is with that being said, a Rue Fitness podcast. We are doing our community spotlight with Michelle Gorman today. How you doing, Michelle? Very well, thank you. Oh, I forgot to introduce my special guest. I mean, my my co-host, co who's not normally <laughs> my co-host, but she's still the most. I'm your co-host in life. Emily Schneller, co-owner of Rue Fitness. What up, guys? I'll, I'll include a laugh track in there. I mean, a clap track, sorry. Perfect. Clap track. Um, <laughs> so, Michelle, uh, you moved back to New Orleans, what, about six months ago? Not back to New Orleans, here for the first time. Oh, here for the first time. Yeah. I got bad information from my co-host. I just said, I didn't know if she was from here or not. So you're not from here originally? No, I was born in Washington, D.C. and have pretty much been there for almost 40 years you know and what i think made my me brothers think that you were from here mm. is you costume hard oh i went <laughs> i went all in oh yeah my, you did girl. i went so all in and it was a life-changing experience to be emily totally said honest. emily goes she showed me your costume from <laughs> lundy Gras, and i said oh she must be in the red beans and rice parade like, you know, it was nothing. Well, not a lot of people know what the Red Beans and Rice Parade is. It, is. It, was de it was Dead Beans, which is the spinoff of Red Beans. Oh, see, that's yeah. even more Yeah, like, I'm local. like a local. Yeah. Well, but that's the whole thing. So, so my older brother went to Tulane. He's two years older than me, and I'm, I'll be 40 on the 4th of July. So he went to Tulane and met his wife like their third day of college. So they've been together for like over 20 years. Um, and then they left and ended up coming back after uh, like eight years later and went to law school and got his master's. And then my little brother went to Loyola and he's never left. Like he was here, he was in college during Katrina and you know packed stuff to be gone for two or three days and was gone for two or three months. Um, but there, my older sister-in-law, like she goes so hard on Mardi Gras, like it's, and she prepped me. She wrote me a schedule, like uh, a month and a half before told me exactly what I needed, where I should focus my costume energy. Like, <laughs> I, I mean, and I had so much fun. What'd you think? Of, I like, mean, so that was that your first Mardi Gras? Or yeah. have you experienced it before? Yeah. No, no, I had like, Very first. I babysat with my mom a couple of years ago, my nieces, while my brother and sister-in-law went out of town and we had like an off night and I went to Muses and like, that was all, that was, that, that was it. Yeah. Yeah. That was it. But I mean, it felt like a, like an, it was like a spiritual experience. Yeah. Now I you mean, know why we don't leave. <laughs> oh yeah. No, no, no. I mean, it's, it, it was, uh. I'm super, super grateful that, you know, it happened right. before all of this because it, it made me really feel like I live here and yeah. like this is home now. So I had such, oh my God, I That's had awesome. such a good time. Yeah. Did your, did your brothers have to put a hard sell on you to move here? No, not even. It was, it was kind of me flip-flopping for years. Like I always wanted to, but I was, I had this weird thing in my head that I would just like... I don't know, like neither, like not fit in or I felt like too DC or I don't even know. Um, or that I would kind of be like an extension of them. It's like, it's hard to make friends sometimes as an adult again. And it, I just felt, I don't know. I was all, all up in my head about it, but you know, come last summer, I was just so, so, so ready to get out of DC and ready for a change. And I have a nephew who's, um almost a nephew who's eight and three nieces under the age of five so i was just like i don't have kids yet and i just want to be you know closer to them and like be a part of their everyday life rather than just like popping into town you know that's awesome so you mentioned you don't have kids uh <laughs> mm -mm. but you run a birth fit exercise program yeah i'm, I'm technically what i call a certified birth fit coach right yeah. So, yeah. And even the founder of the founder of BirthFit is this badass chick, Lindsay Matthews, who also is not yet a mom. She's oh, um, a CrossFit coach and a doula and a chiropractor. And uh, yeah, I mean, it's one of those things. It's like, it's an experience that I have yet to go through that I definitely 
would like to, and I'm pushing, pushing the age where I need to kind of get shit figured out sooner than later. But um, yeah, I mean, like, I know women's bodies and um, it's just, you know, it's like sh she surrounds herself with all these people and many of them are mothers, you know, so it's, it's a big community of all different types of people. Did you but, feel like it was a calling? I kind of did. I had this weird, when I had to, so um, I went in 2017 to New Jersey for a three-day coaches training after we kind of stumbled upon BirthFit at my, at my um, old gym, my work in DC, because we had this like crazy surge of pregnant members one summer. Like mm -hmm. there were like seven or eight members who were super fit and super active who all Mountains were pregnant. In the water. Yeah. No, no, no. That's what's funny is because we literally had this running joke that we would warn people, be careful because <laughs> you, you might end up, you might end up with a baby whether yeah. you want it or not. If you drink the water here, it was so ridiculous. Um, but yeah, we, we kind of, you know, didn't totally, the, the information that was out there was so confusing and so mixed, especially with like, how, how they felt in their own bodies compared to what doctors were telling them, which were totally different depending on what doctor they had. And then their friends and their family, all of these, like the, the information was, was totally all over the place. And we, and, and they, we wanted to be able to, to give them information and, and guidance and support that we could stand by. Yeah. Evidence-based um, information yeah. rather than yes. who knows. All that. And yeah. I'm super big on that anyways. So, yeah. Um, so yeah, we went looking. And, and when you asked about like a calling, I had this one. So we went to this weekend in, in New Jersey and I was totally blown away. My, my coworker and I drove to New Jersey and, um, totally blown away by the women and like the community and the science part of birth fit is based on DNS dynamic neuromuscular stabilization, which I had a couple years before, um, gone to, I have a, I'm DNS certified. And, and I was like, when it was coming up a lot of the, when it was coming up in the workshop, I was like, wait a second, I know this, I know this stuff. Like, and it's been used in a lot of my rehab with my physical therapists. And I was like, this totally makes like all the sense in the world. So, um, after that weekend, we immediately, my, my coworker, Kristen and I immediately knew that we wanted to apply to be regional directors, um, for, for, uh, DC. And in the process of writing like kind of an essay application, I had this epiphany of like, maybe I'm not supposed to have children or not, not supposed to, but maybe that's just like not in my cards. And maybe this is the way that I get to be a part of this experience. Mm -hmm. If that kind of makes any sense. I don't know. I've kind of gone a different route with that where I'm like, no, I want, I want to have a baby, but right. Um, I want to back it up a little bit. So I yeah, saw it. Sorry, I, I'm really. No, it's okay. <laughs> you get excited about it. I like it. Um, I, saw, I saw basically you have about 100 different certifications behind your name. Um, I've got a lot. <laughs> were, you, were you a full-time coach in DC? Yeah, and um, I started coaching kind of accidentally in 2010, 2009, 2010. And I, ha I worked at a a private like small group training studio um, in Georgetown in DC. And I ended up being there for six years and I had without the intention of, of kind of falling in that trap. Um, but I had a boss who, while we didn't always <laughs> get along personality wise, um, he was an incredible mentor and was like so all about continuing education. So he wanted us to be the best and like paid for every certification sent us to perform better summits every year. Like we just, he wanted us to be super well-rounded. So like what did you do? What'd you do before you got into fitness? Oh, I took a really, really long road to finishing college. Yeah. I like, uh, I went to NYU at, out, out of all girls private Catholic high school, <laughs> which I didn't want to be there. And so you fit um, in perfectly here. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. 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 So, um, were you an athlete growing up? 
Yeah, I, well, so I'm, I'm the only girl between two boys. My dad's like the most diehard Notre Dame football fan, like head to toe in everything Notre Dame. You know, I was like, grew up Redskins, a, a lot of sports. Um, and my brothers um, would cut the heads off of my Barbies or, or cut their hair off or like draw on their faces with permanent marker. So it was like, pushed into tomboy land, like kind of without a choice. <laughs> so yeah, I played um, basketball and swam competitively. And I, but incidentally, I also took ballet for 14 years and um, was like in the Joffrey Nutcracker and you like- Very well-rounded. <laughs> kind of, yeah, I guess. <laughs> yeah, I but it. then, but puberty hit me really, really hard. And I like, I gained like 15 pounds in one year and I was like, I'm never putting a leotard on ever again. Hmm. And yeah, so it went kind of. Sarah and I talk about uh, <coughs> her experience, like dancing and stuff like that. Um, how hard or like terrible was the pressure to look a certain way when you were oh, dancing? It was, it was, I feel like I didn't totally think about it when I was younger, but once I started, especially getting into to high school and like that year of, I literally in one year I went from, from weighing 95 pounds to like 115 pounds in one year. Mm -hmm. And I was like, what, what the, what the hell is happening to my body? Right. Mm -hmm. And, and that is when a lot of like kind of body dysmorphic shit started. And that lasted for a long time. Mm -hmm. I remember, and I ate my feelings like super hardcore. Like I, every, I remember very clearly every single day, I would come home from school and eat an entire bag of movie theater butter popcorn to myself. And like, uh, you know, it was, oh, but it was so good. It's, but yeah, it's, that was, I kind of fell out of, like I didn't want to swim anymore because I had to be in a bathing suit. I didn't want to do ballet because I had to be in a leotard. And so I tried softball, but I'm like super hyper mobile. And every time I threw the ball, it was like not to where it was supposed to go. Yeah. It's, it's probably, people probably wouldn't think this uh, about me, but because I never wear a shirt now, but back when I was <laughs> in high school, like I would, I would never swim without a shirt. Like from eighth grade on, I always swam with a shirt, even maybe into a couple years into college, uh, yeah. which is bizarre. And I, and I mean, <laughs> I was just embarrassed, you know? Um, yeah. So maybe that leads to why I walk around half naked all the time now. Well, I'm just curious if that experience with like the body dysmorphia helps you relate to the women oh, yeah. training. Without, yeah. Without a doubt. I mean, I like there's it's zero effort for me to be empathetic in that in that situation. Like I've I've been on, you know, various roller coasters since I was a teenager with with my weight mm -hmm. and you know, but I think we're like getting back into to fitness later on in my life was like a really big eye opener that it's like I just don't have I thought I had just like shit genetics kind of mm -hmm. and I was like no 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 I can like actually I can I can change how my body looks it mm -hmm. just it just takes the right kind of stuff yeah I always say that like genetics does matter when it comes to maybe reaching a certain body type or being right. able to do a certain thing, but it's not an excuse to be obese. No, not at no. all. And one of the, the big things that sold me with my first boss in that gym that I, you know, had, had no intention of staying at for six years was I had, and I'm, and I'm like, no joke, a concave ass. Like it was like beyond pancake. That's like me. I still have a, still have a pancake <laughs> ass. But I was like, I was so, I was so self-conscious about it. And I was like super embarrassed. And I like one day mentioned it to, to my boss. And he was like, oh dude, well, we can change that. Like, look how you stand. And I was like, what do you mean? And he was like, stand. And I'm going to, and he took a picture of me and I was floored. Like, I had really, really crazy sway back posture and would just like hear oh, like, and, and it, and 
like my butt muscles had zero chance of doing any work or even knowing they existed based on my posture. And my breathing was totally a mess. I was like a crazy chest breather. I didn't even know what a diaphragm was, like all this stuff. And he was, he was like, oh no, we're gonna, we're gonna fix you. And so like worked on my breathing and like actually learned how to breathe right. And then um, got me doing exercises that I had not been doing, which was squatting and deadlifting and lunging. And like, and I'm like pretty proud of my ass now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know no. what I mean? Like, yeah, it's like one of the features I think I love the most about myself. Do you wear right? cheeky bikini oh. bottoms? Yes, and I'm and very short shorts She's that like, my look go. at my butt right now. Sometimes well, Emily, every, <laughs> no, sometimes Emily will have like booty shorts on from working out, and <clears throat> she's like embarrassed to go pick up the kids or go to the grocery store. I'm like, f that. You work for that ass, Thank girl. You. Show it. I need more, more, more men in you, but in, like you in my life, because my brother, my little brother's like, are you going out like that? Or he'll yes. be like, that looks like underwear, and like you know, and I don't care, but. Yeah, I do. I feel awkward like dropping my kids off at daycare. In booty shorts. Now, here's the crazy thing is that it's actually probably more acceptable for you to drop the kids off in booty shorts than for me to wear white tights to my daughter's preschool. And shirtless. Yeah, That's true. I wore these white tights that she leaves nothing to the imagination. <laughs> no shorts on top, just white tights. And because I look cool. And had like an infinity scarf on and stuff and dropped my daughter off. And uh, I'm pretty sure everybody was like, what is he thinking? But that's what I love about the city is like, you you know, it's it's not that crazy. In, in, no. Yeah. I mean, you can, you know, be your, be your own crazy self. And it's like not totally frowned upon. Yeah. So I think people are envious of it, actually. I, I think people don't understand. Like I always have a hard time describing what New Orleans is or why mm -hmm. we stay despite so many of the terrible things. Um, yeah. And it's because it's stuff that you can't find anywhere else and totally it's feelings true. and culture and, yep. and people think, Oh, culture is Mardi Gras. And I'm like, it's not Mardi Gras. It's how we interact at yeah. Mardi Gras. Yeah. Yeah. You know? Yeah, definitely. I, f I tell people all the time. It's like, I feel like I live in a village. Yeah. Like that's how, that's how it feels. And there's just like, like, all of my neighbors, we all know each other. We have each other's phone numbers. We bake for each other. We like do all this stuff. And I'm like the condo that I lived in, in DC before I moved, I didn't know any of anyone, like any of my neighbors. And I was there for seven, like, it's just, it's just different. It's mm -hmm. so different. And it just is, yeah. It just feels like, you know, a big weird hug all the time. I love it. <laughs> Go ahead. Well, I just want to, like, I know we talked about how you kind of fell into birth fit and, you know, why you're empathetic of these women, especially in this time that a lot of them are feeling very vulnerable and yeah. insecure about their bodies. But tell, like, can we step, take a step back and talk about what birth fit is? Is it training yeah. women for birth? Like, let's talk about what it is. <clears throat> yeah. So, I mean, the, the big umbrella term is that it's a, it's a freaking movement that is trying to change the narrative around pregnancy, birth, and postpartum, particularly in the U.S. Um, but it's... What do you think that narrative is? So I feel like right now, I mean, it's, it's definitely changing. Like if you look at the history of birth, you can kind of see where things come, have de why they've developed, and it's been very male-dominated. Um, but, you know, um, I think right now... <clears throat> Pregnancy is kind of seen as this like super fragile medicalized state um, and and very fear pumped like fear driven um, and it goes I, with you know in the last couple of years particularly I've interacted with a you know way more pregnant women who are fit and in touch with their bodies and whatever and they and it's like goes against how they feel intuitively like. I have a prenatal client here and I um, socially distanced, went to her house the other day and she was, she had contacted me because she felt um, super defeated and like, um, like she had no choice. Like people were telling her, her, her doctor was like, you don't want to lift more than 25 pounds and you can't get your heart rate up above 140 BPM. And it's like, 
total bullshit and completely not based on anything um, absolutely at all so and so the whole why i was drawn to birth fit is that it totally flips the script yeah. so rather than than um seeing women you know in this state as as fragile um they view pregnancy as a woman's body gearing up to be literally the fittest version of itself humanly possible uh to and to get um to be ready to complete what is like no joke a huge athletic event which is called birth yeah and you need like what do you do when you train for an athletic event or a marathon you know what do you to, to prepare you train for it like physically mentally all of the things um so it's it's been kind of just super eye-opening and the whole goal is to just educate and empower women and their partners and their families and you know their entire support network to um, make decisions about their bodies based on like legit accurate real information um, <clears throat> and their intuition and to make the choices from a place of love and power rather than fear. Yeah. which is very different than a way a lot of people experience pregnancy and birth, especially in the U.S. At and, amen. Yeah. <laughs> At 32 weeks uh, for our firstborn, Emily left her doctor <laughs> 32 weeks yeah. when she, when she mean, gave him her the birth plan. You. And he was like, no, you can't do any of this. And she's like, right. well, I, I think I can. And so we switched uh, to the midwives at that point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there you go. I mean, that's the whole thing. It's like, it's this like fear is pumped in and this doubt of like like you know your body better than anybody and 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 anyone that's trying to tell you different than how you feel at like a really deep level is just fucked up <laughs> yeah you know what do you um, you said that the narrative you feel like is changing though what do you i think mean i hope so um, I mean, more evidence when like younger yeah, doctors, yeah, definitely more evidence and like a little bit more rise and, and re, re like come back in midwifery and, yeah. um, and doulas and the, the documentary, the business of being born that was yeah. in 2008. I mean, it was, was huge. You know, um, if anyone is curious about it, you should totally watch it because it'll, open your eyes. It's one of the um, reasons why I, I mean, I presented my birth plan to my doctor and he was like, no, 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 no. Yeah. And well, they're not taught. They're not taught how to, they're taught how to intervene. Like that's. Well, it was ridiculous things too, that he was disagreeing with. Like I requested on my birth plan to not keep offering me the epidural. I was like, right. if I want it, I'll ask for it, but yeah. please don't like try to ask me every five you. minutes. Yeah. And he was like, that's ridiculous. So they, you can't tell them not to ask you if you want it. And I'm like, why? You know, like, it's your, like it's, <laughs> yeah. It's like, there's just such, such little respect for, for, for your, what you want, you know? Yeah. And this is and a crazy not to bash experience. doctors either. No, not at all. There not are at all. amazing doctors and thank goodness for <coughs> doctors, especially when interventions are necessary. But I do think that the narrative, I, I agree with you. I feel like it's changing, um, but it, it needs to. <laughs> yeah. And, the, and, and with that too is I still though think like with it changing in a, in a, in a positive way, um, like the guidelines for um, the association for um, um, ACOG, uh, obstetrics and gynecology they've mm -hmm. changed their guidelines to um to be less pushing for uh, advocate advocating interventions um and and one of the biggest things within the last couple of years is to um encourage follow-up visits beyond six weeks Mm -hmm. um, with doctors and midwives and, and changing that. But what I was thinking, what I was going to say before is yes, things are, are changing in, in for the better, but also social media with social media being out there, 
you know, it's also becoming even more confusing because there's a lot of like fit pregnant women who are not uh, coaches or who are, you know, who are not necessarily giving advice based on the science. They're right. just doing what they do and putting it on. And then people look and see. They're Insta you know, famous and they think yeah. that that makes them an authority. Yeah. And it's like, your body is not necessarily going to look like that pregnant body. And it's like, it even is putting, you know, it just like puts weird stuff in, in, in people's heads already at a time where there's like so many unknowns and, and a lot of fear and, you know, but um, yeah, I just like super dig birth fit and, and the way they approach things. Cause it's all about empowering with like real knowledge from like a lot of different places and taking on and taking into consideration, into consideration the most recent research mm -hmm. and the most recent studies. And then also cues from other cultures around the world and how, and which is very views pregnancy and postpartum super different than we do. Um, yeah. And so even like the, the pregnancy view is kind of flipped and the, the postpartum view is flipped. Equally. Well, that's what I was going to ask about because yeah. I, I feel like the postpartum <coughs> part is maybe uh, lost in all of this totally. because there's a lot of focus on leading up and like mothers are expected like, hey, I want to stay active. Like even, even the people yeah. that are in tune and, and this is just what I'm saying, obviously, like, a guy here, um, <laughs> but just what I see in the gym. Your is opinion is valid still. Right. <laughs> There's a lot of focus on, or, you know, I'm, I'm going to try to stay active. I'm going to do this, but at the same time I'm pregnant and I can give myself grace throughout this entire period. Right. Mm -hmm. But then after it's like, Oh, well, you know, I hit four weeks or I hit six weeks. Let's rip the bandaid off and go. Yep. You know? Yep. And I know that that's not the right answer. Emily said no. something to me. Um, Cause I didn't really know. I didn't have any guidelines to help her when she was going through all of this, but she had, I think you read like some birth fit materials or not, or, or something similar. I think yeah. there was some CrossFit birth site that we used to follow. Um, but one of the things that she said that always kind of stuck with me is that it, you know, it, it took nine months to put this weight on and give yourself nine months to take yep. it off, you yep. know? And that always kind of stuck with me because I don't like people to rush it. Um, but the other thing is that, your body experiences a lot of bumps and bruises throughout this entire process mm -hmm. and things are going to be different after, you yep. know, and it's, it's something that none of us are equipped to, to assist with, but from, you know, jumping rope, urinating while you're jumping rope to, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of the pelvic floor stuff to your abs, what's it called? Diastasis recti. Yeah. Um, there's just a lot of different things. So can you kind of tell me about, your approach and how you can help with someone postpartum? Yeah, so the kind of prevailing stereotypes, um, there's a lot of pressure for women to bounce back, right? And immediately post-birth, it's like this, this race to get your pre-baby body back. And um, the birth fit view, which I am a hundred percent behind is that you cannot undo birth. There's no such thing as your pre baby body. So nope. it's completely unrealistic to even, yeah, it's just, it's just as simple as that. They see postpartum as forever. It's not done at six weeks. It's not done at six months and not, it's not done at a year. Like I've had, um, clients, uh, in my postpartum series that had babies six years ago that had diastasis so bad I could stick my fist in between their abdominal muscles. And it's, it's really unfortunate that a lot, it's kind of seen as just like this part of womanhood um, that going, having urinary incontinence or crazy chronic low back pain or painful sex or this or whatever, that it's a part of just a part of having kids and it's not it doesn't it's not normal and it doesn't need to be that way so yeah so birth fit sees um postpartum is forever and rather than you know this race to bounce back there's an acknowledgement that everyone's every woman's healing journey is totally different and what you can see on the outside is potentially totally different than what's going on on the inside and you don't know. And most women um, will take at least six months, if not 
a year or more to fully heal. Um, and there's a lot of factors that affect your healing process, you know, your fitness level, obviously genetics, epigenetics stuff. Um, but also, um, what interventions you had, what type, what, what your birth experience was, whether you have, have had kids previously, what those birth experiences were like, if how you were coached to push, um, inter yeah, again, like any interventions, all interventions add on to healing timeline. Um, and so it's like honoring the whole, like the, the, the postpartum period is there's birth fit kind of sees it as these four, um, different, um, periods within the entire first year. So, um, and, and it's really viewed as a time to like totally slow things down especially that initial couple weeks, like lie in, bond with your baby, lots of skin to skin. Like um, it isn't about letting a lot of people come over and do these things and going outside and, and trying to like resume normal life, you know? Um, and then, so that's what they call this co-regulation period where it's zero to two weeks. It's just like a lying in. Um, and then from two weeks to six weeks is quote unquote a recovery period. Um, where rather than, you know, even if you feel like you're ready to go back to class, it's like, there's a lot going on that still needs to heal. So it's a good time, um, to reestablish proper breathing, learn about intra creating intra-abdominal pressure. That's going to be able to serve you later. Um, and then, um, slowly incorporating with like intention and awareness, functional movements back in. So mm -hmm. there's co-regulation, um, a recovery period, then this six weeks to 12 weeks is like a rehab period where it can be this really incredible, beautiful opportunity to recalibrate your core and pelvic floor literally from the ground up, which is why I named my business from the ground up, FYI. <laughs> um, and, and like come back as an even stronger version of yourself but like starting, starting from the beginning. And the really cool thing um, about BirthFit, which I was, it's very kind of science meets hippies, like the way they do things, which is kind of what I like because I feel like I'm kind of both of those things anyways. Um, yeah. Um, but they take, so, so this is a neat fact. When, does it, should we t say what diastasis is so that I'm like, yeah, that'd be good. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I don't yeah. know a lot of people know. So a hundred percent. it looks like Emily's <laughs> belly looks like a Rhodesian Ridgeback. <laughs> that's a good, that's, that's a, that's a good uh, reference. Um, yeah. But so, so diastasis is the, the sep separation of the abdominal wall and the, the latest research, the latest findings is that it happens in 100% of women by the end of their pregnancy. The degree on which to, to which you know you can see it is going to be different per people and depends on a bunch of factors. But it's a natural adaptation that you're from uh, from a growing belly, mm -hmm. and when you're pregnant, your body's producing a hormone called relaxin, which loosens your ligaments and your tendons. So makes doing it's, squats pregnant awesome. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you can get real deep, real deep. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, but it's like, it's a protective mechanism. So it's not like, and people think like, oh, the separation of the abdominal wall, like one day, all of a sudden it's going to be like, and they're going to feel it. And it's just going to be this like event, but it, it's, it's not how it happens. It's just like one day you might like, uh, one day you might be laying down and you sit up and you see the Rhodesian Ridgeback in your belly. And you're like, what the hell is that? Uh -huh. That's, that's what it is. Um, and the, the truth is there are movements and, and things that you can do that promote it staying together and things that you can do that will exacerbate the, the tension in being pulled apart. Do you um, mean while pregnant and yeah, postpartum? Yes. While pregnant oh, and postpartum. Yeah. Huh. So that's why like <clears throat> a lot of the stuff that I teach prenatal clients it's the same stuff that carries over. But the fun fact that I was going to 
tell you is that babies are born with diastasis. You can go feel in to your baby between uh, usually around four and a half months is when the closure starts happening, mm -hmm. but you'll feel there's, there's hmm. that the wall is not closed. So the really cool thing about DNS and about the science part of like the rehab part of birth bit, um, is that, um, it takes, goes back to how we moved as babies, these like milestone movements that are universal to the human race. Like nobody teaches babies how to press up. Nobody teaches babies how to roll over. Nobody mm -hmm. teaches babies how to sit up, how <clears throat> to crawl, how to stand, how to walk. Mm -hmm. um, and babies, when they're four and a half months old around that time, the movements that you see them doing that look like nothing, <clears throat> which is dead buggy movements like opposite mm -hmm. arm and leg, yeah. are actually their body and, and rolling <clears throat> is it closes, closes the diastasis. Like yeah. So it's like really cool to be able to go back to those movements and your babies already know how to breathe properly. Like right. you see big baby bellies, you know, they're not sucking in and breathing in their chest and they know how to create pressure in their core system. Mm -hmm. And all of that stuff is necessary for the closure of diastasis. Yeah. And, and to be able to do these motor pattern sequences um it, like rolling and it's, it's the really same way cool. like you know if somebody who has had very little experience with exercise comes in and i ask them to do an air squat like they're very rarely going to do it right, right right with all the technique yeah but my kids yep like i don't have to tell perfect. them a thing it's perfect no. yeah i'm you like watch oh, your squat form is so good yeah it's really cool once you know all this stuff like once we teach moms yeah uh, and so a lot of the postpartum series that i've done it's it's a mom focused class mm -hmm. but you know if you need to bring non-mobile babies they can come and we've right. had a couple times where literally what i was teaching the mom the baby's doing the baby's right. doing <laughs> so it's been so cool and it's like oh you want like look this is this is this is how you do this it's this is good super, form it's really 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 cool i love that the so, other thing that i was gonna um just mention after hearing you talk so i had <laughs> pelvic floor therapy after my son was born oh, it was a awesome. very long labor um i pushed for a really long time he was a very large baby um and i mean working at a gym and you yeah. know, double unders. It took me oh, yeah. a year to be able to do double unders again, not Without because being... I couldn't do them, but because I had to stop every time yeah. and recollect myself. Yeah. yeah. Yep. So the thing that surprised me, I think most about pelvic floor therapy, everybody just thinks it's kegels, but no, oh, they, you need was, to find someone that's going in there too. Well, that uh, the biofeedback yeah. aspect of it was really yep. cool, but like all the breath work and you don't even oh, yeah. think about like, no. how is your breath associated with, with your pelvic floor? Like, right. why does that even help? And I was like, yeah. oh, this makes a lot of sense. <laughs> yeah. So there's, there's a, it's, it's interesting. You know, if you think about your core, like your, your true core is from, from here all the way to your pelvic floor. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but if you think of your core like this. This is exactly what my therapist talked about. Yeah. But it's, it's, it's like an easy way to, yeah. to understand it. Yep. So the top of, of your can is your diaphragm and your diaphragm is a muscle, mm -hmm. <clears throat> right? So in order to close the top, your diaphragm needs to know that it exists in the first place and needs to know that it has a job and mm -hmm. needs to know how to be used properly. So the <clears throat> starting with proper breathing is the only way to get this part secure. Mm -hmm. The bottom of the can is pelvic floor. Mm -hmm. So without, um, and then all around, you've got all the muscles and, and ligaments, connective tissue and bones and all that stuff. My dog has like an empty can of something, <laughs> like lighter fluid, like rusted oh, wow. lighter. That doesn't sound safe. No, I don't. <laughs> No, you but it's like it. really old and empty. Yeah, hold on a second. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> good take care of that. She's like, like what? 
is this? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. That is. Oh, right. That's not great. <laughs> no. No, she was playing with a worm earlier. It was, or a grub. It was really funny. Um, okay. So, yeah, the bottom, top diaphragm, bottom pelvic floor, and then all the stuff. You know, what we think of as abs is just, is literally just this, like mm -hmm. this part we forget about the top and the bottom and all the other stuff, which is yeah. like totally way more important. So <clears throat> the thing that's interesting about the pelvic floor is that you have two states and we often only talk about one state. So you've got a contracted state, think of your Kegel, classic Kegel, but mm -hmm. then there's also this relaxed state, which is, can be thought of like a hammock. Um, and a lot of women will already have an overactive contracted That's state. Yeah, That's and, I, and I have it too, oh. and I have not had kids. Yeah. I, have, I have peeing issues right here. Yeah. Um, and so if you are only talking about doing Kegels, then all you're doing is creating this like totally chronic state. Yeah. And then when you're required to be in the hammock, you go Pfft. Yep. So what's really helpful is learning how to get back to here rather than just this, we're like in this hammock state. Mm -hmm. And the way, one of the a really effective way to do that, first you close the top and then without mm, pushing, like, like bearing down, you start breathing into your belly create this 360 degree pressurized system right so it's not necessarily bracing it's just creating um pressure that's like a volume switch it's not on or off it's like mm -hmm. a volume like how you would <clears throat> um create pressure in your belly or in your core when you're picking up a pencil versus deadlifting 300 pounds is totally different mm -hmm. so but in order for the pelvic floor to have something to respond to the, the diaphragm has to descend. Mm -hmm. Like it responds, like it, it <clears throat> with the, when the diaphragm descends, when you breathe down, your pelvic floor will automatically, automatically respond. Um, and so if your diaphragm has no idea what it's even doing and it's, you're a chest breather and anything, you're not <clears throat> giving it anything to respond to. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Like the, another analogy was like, a boat, think of like a boat analogy where um, your, um, your, uh, oh God, no, I can't even remember the boat analogy. <laughs> Are those the two like issues that you see most often is pelvic floor <sighs> issues and the diastasis recti? Are those the yeah, two well, big ones? Well, so think diastasis though is more a reason that becomes it's 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 like it be it's the cause of other symptoms that become more problematic so like think of diastasis as like a dent in this can mm -hmm. like this so it's going to be harder this with this dent your canister is not as strong it's not as sturdy you're mm -hmm. not a, be able to pressurize the system as well so what happens when that happens is Dias unhealed diastasis will often be a cause that leads to low back pain, painful sex, urinary incontinence, lack of orgasm, all these things. So mm -hmm. it's less of an, it's not necessarily this like, like when you're pregnant and you get diastasis, it's not like you're going to hurt the baby or like whatever you want. The goal is to not get it to a point of no return where it can be really hard to heal afterwards because nobody wants to deal with those issues. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like, no, I don't want chronic low back pain. I don't, I don't want to pee when I jump or sneeze. Like, but if you just title the, your seminar, that. how to orgasm more, <laughs> right? Then how not to pee when it'll sneezing be and how to have packed. an orgasm. That's true. <laughs> but it's like, that's the thing. It's like, you know, I can say, get back in touch with your pre-baby body like with your with your new body and all these things and and those are what I want people to hear too is like honor your postpartum 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 body and all these things but I but what I've realized in like trying to explain what I do like you have to talk about those things that mm -hmm. that 
that are like people it's going to resonate with people of like oh i have that wait a second you know like that's not normal oh so can you fix diastasis with exercise or is yes. it only some yeah you can totally fix it yeah with breath work and like i was saying these these <clears throat> so she doesn't need to spend ten thousand dollars for a surgery to fix it no depending i mean it's like you have to be pretty far gone um, in terms of like, I remember I t told you that I was able to stick my fist. Yeah. Like that's, that's not good. And that requires a lot of stuff that like exercise is just probably. Do you want to um, show her your belly right now? No. Or <laughs> 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 no. <laughs> and what's interesting to note is that men get diastasis too. Like it is not, there's a lot of people out there, um, where you see like six packs, but then like a ridge in the middle, like that's diastasis, that's core dysfunction. I had a, a coach- Is that from weight gain? Like previous it, weight gain? No, not necessarily. So um, I had uh, a coach, one of my coworkers in DC, a dude who was, you know, a pretty uh, big guy, um, Olympic lifter, and he um, was, had kind of, shit form on doing ghd sit-ups and he totally got diastasis and we and this is like a dude that did not want to listen to us but we took him taught him the movements that we teach new like postpartum moms in mm -hmm. order to fix it and it requires slowing things down and just doing body weight stuff but doing it Shocker. like crazy slowly yeah what did he say after <clears throat> I mean, he had no idea that he could have it. He thought it was, and he was, but I mean, you know, he was like, oh, wow. I mean, he was totally just kind of very, definitely impressed and like kind of humbled, I guess, because he definitely looked at us as though we were doing, you know, silly stuff. What about, <laughs> what about biggest mistakes like that you see yeah. pregnant women or postpartum women especially doing in the gym and you're like oh <clears throat> are there mm -hmm. like it's hard to watch yeah it's, yeah at this point it's hard to watch without wanting to say something so um it might seem kind of counterintuitive but um any flexiony super flexiony movements are actually going to pull the muscles apart further so you think of like high flexion movements like um sit-ups, crunches, um, kipping movements, hanging knee raises, Is that to bar. postpartum too or just while you're pregnant? Both. So <clears throat> all of those movements are going to, are pulling this way. Mm -hmm. So in pregnancy, you know, we're trying, diastasis is, you know, going to happen. It's just like, you don't want to make it worse, Exacerbate which it, is going right. to make it harder to heal postpartum. And then postpartum, you're trying to put that stuff back together. So why do things that are going to keep it apart? Mm -hmm. so, and women definitely want to do that. They want to hit all the ab workouts after. Oh yeah. Um, so, <clears throat> um, yeah. Crunches, um, sit-ups, toes to bar kipping, hanging knee raises, um so something probably like a hollow sense. body hold would be good hollow, because it pushes it together well no no, no it doesn't really? so no so what what changes is that like heads head off the ground um we want the low back to be everything to be completely neutral um so but the, the cool thing is though is that there's so many other movements that you can tweak that are based off of we call them functional progressions these are these um these milestone movements that babies make that we reteach that i reteach moms and you can make the the most awesome core exercises out of all of this stuff things like um, dead bugs yeah. yeah but it's like like but there's i kind of want to show you some stuff can i show you yeah is that like yeah yeah let's see it and i'll right. i'll give the play-by-play for those right, just, gonna, listening. just listening. I can't, I, I'm gonna have to take this out. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, Michelle is currently trying Should to figure out her headphones right now. I know, should I change my microphone so that you can hear me off of this? No, you could just demonstrate the movement and I'll, okay. I'll kind of- So I'm gonna take you through. It's like <clears throat> um, replicating the movements that happens from three months to 12 months of a baby. 
Like, so these are the milestone movements, but this is how we teach it super, super slow. Um, and there, and then you can, uh, there's a tons of different ways to tweak these individual movements and the transitions to turn them into core, to core exercises to train prenatal and postpartum. And all of this stuff promotes the closure of DRA and the, securing the top and the bottom of your core and all that stuff. But breathing is the first foundation, which you can't really see. I'm kidding. Right. Okay, <laughs> hold on. Let's, let's see. Yeah. That's a little now you get to see my booty shorts. You know why? <laughs> I'm sorry. All right. Oh, that butt looks good, Michelle. All right, you. so Michelle is in on the ground doing dead bugs, legs straight up in the air, arms up in the air. We're going opposite hand and foot to extension. You can tell she used to be a dancer. Yeah, now we're rolling <laughs> into a uh, clamshell position, um, side plank. Ooh, this looks difficult. Bradley's going to steal that one. Yeah, we're going to do this. <laughs> oh. Oh, look at this. Like now we're into a quadruped position. Um, and then we are doing like contralateral planks. Um, She's extending opposite hand and foot. Position. You are so technical and jargony. Uh, sorry. <laughs> now we're doing um, kind of like a quadruped crawl, crawl forward, with a but wide it looks knee. like with a wide knee uh, going out. That looks nice into the bottom of a squat. Um, and then we're back into a squat. This looks like a nice little flow here. And then we're back into a reverse quadruped crawl that's basically all fours, knees slightly off the ground. And then we're back into that clamshell positioning, rolling back into this baby position. Yay! Jeez, that looked tough. <laughs> Michelle, I can't wait for you to hear the commentary oh when you listen back to the podcast. <laughs> It's going to be like, and now? Because I was doing uh, like a play-by-play, -play, like a football oh God. announcer. Oh, God. It was pretty legit. What? Anyways, yeah, that's, those are the functional progressions from the beginning to the end. But it's like you can add weights to dead bugs. You can add bands pulling you laterally to dead bugs. You can do all sorts of really cool stuff with bands and lighter weights. Um, so many options in the bear position. My new favorite is toilet paper around the world where you're in a bear position mm -hmm. and you take toilet paper put it on your back hand goes back take it back put it back down but there's all sorts of stuff that you can do and it's all actually promotes the closure yeah love it yeah. um do you teach mainly in a class setting or privates well so this is how things are have been totally flipped upside down with yeah. Corona because I, um, because I have a lot of different types of connections into um, the birth world. Mm -hmm. So like um, I have a bunch of friends who are doctors. I have friends who are doulas who know midwives, but then I'm also a CrossFit coach, you know, like into the CrossFit world, there's all these different avenues that I have access to. So rather than like trying to work in one place, what I decided to do is create this company so that I can kind of offer my services wow. to mm -hmm. the wider masses, to people mm -hmm. that already have established communities. Um, and so my goal was to do like what I've been doing in DC is kind of small group. Usually it's no more than 10, sometimes five to 10 is a prenatal fitness series with all moms, mom to be moms to be mm -hmm. who, and then, and then a postpartum series, mm -hmm. um, in a group, in a gym or in a studio or in a, in a space. Mm -hmm. Um, but considering the world that we're living in now, um, I'm working on some virtual stuff, um, which is, it's challenging in its own right, but it's, you know, it's, it's something cause I really like being able to touch people, <laughs> you know, and like that, that, um, that energy that comes with like a group of new moms getting together and like talking about the shit that they know, they know they can't talk about at home. Yeah. Um, yeah. So virtual coaching yeah, has I don't been know. interesting. You kind of have to flex that muscle a little bit harder. Like I know in my oh, level yeah. two 
coaching certification, they talk about like <coughs> visual cues and verbal cues and tactile cues and all you Everyone have really learns are verbal now. <laughs> Right. When yeah. Virtual classes. So I know it's, yeah. it's definitely challenging, but I mean, I'm hoping, um, I'm hoping that eventually like for now doing things virtually, but even, you know, like I, I have, um, a prenatal client and I go to her house, but we just stay, you know, six feet apart from each other. Yeah. But, um, yeah, no, I mean, eventually my goal is to, to be able to do, um, the small group small group stuff because it's just like it's such great energy yeah Michelle where can people uh find you on social media um so they can f I mean I have a personal page which is welcome to all let's yeah. hear it all <laughs> let's hear it all let's, let's get all the you get to see a lot page. of yeah. a lot of <laughs> it's a lot of dog stuff but there anyways <laughs> um that's Michelle GDC Michelle GDC is um Instagram and then, but I also um, have the business Instagram that I haven't gotten fully into yet. I'm working with uh, a local um, artist to do my logo and like getting into all, all that kind of stuff. Um, but um, the business Instagram is from dot the dot ground dot up dot fitness. Got it. <laughs> from the but ground yeah. up dot From the ground up Got fitness. It. Awesome. Yeah, it's just kind of love it uh, love it well this has certainly been a good time yeah. i enjoy talking to you um cool. thanks for and, having me uh, Roo -Roo i'm, I'm forward. definitely looking forward to hearing what you have to say yeah yeah <laughs> hang on after hang on uh but make I, sure no, I, I can't wait to see what you said <laughs> make sure everyone to uh rate review and subscribe to our podcast on itunes spotify or google play um it is Fitness. Well, obviously you're listening to it now, but make sure to give us a five-star review and a reviewing, a reviewing, a review <laughs> if you haven't yet, um, and hit that subscribe button. We love you. Uh, thanks for listening. It has been an awesome time with Michelle uh, so and our very special co-host, Emily Schneller. So peace. Woo -woo.